What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Thursday, August 1st, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, our hungry data centers are gobbling up Texas amid AI boom. Sticking in the great state of Texas, Texas pipeline congestion could throttle U.S. exports at a critical time. And finally, Russia and Iran to start work on game-changing energy corridor. We're going to be talking a lot about the Middle East today, unfortunately. Stuhl then tossed over to me. I've got a pretty long segment covering, one, what's happening with oil and gas. I mean, up big after geopolitical tensions rise in the Middle East. So we'll we'll cover all of that. EIA drops. We saw a nice little uh, inventory draw, so we'll cover what that means. We got to talk Hess earnings. Uh, they beat based on a pretty expansive increase in Guyana output relative to the guidance. We'll then check in with BP's earnings. They're also up after they beat earnings, but something super interesting when you dig into the numbers and look at their low carbon and gas division. So we'll get a good trip out of that. And then great opinion piece here. Why City Bank thinks Trump is bearish for oil. Stu and I will go back and forth on this one. A lot of great stuff and a lot of a lot of great stuff in there. So guys, we will cover all that in the bag of chips, guys. As always, I'm Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's start with our power hungry data centers are gobbling up Texas amid AI boom. I'll tell you what, you can't, AI has changed the game around here. It, it is just unbelievable. Let me read just a little bit of this here. Texas soaring energy needs the state's grid by 2030 will need to support 152 gigawatts of demand on peak days. Listen to this, Michael, almost double what it can hurt currently handle in just a few years. It is not going to happen. The, the grid, uh, infamous infamously or infamously buckled during a cold snap in 2021, leaving 4.5 million without power. Here's where it says, I'm concerned about data centers and the consumption of power as AI consuming becomes part of the everyday life. Miss producer, if you could bring up this graphic, hottest server farm markets, take a look at this, Northern Virginia, and then you take a look at Dallas Fort Worth. Michael, two months ago, Dallas Fort Worth, or excuse me, Houston was the first time that we've had more financial people than New York. And so Houston has done a great job bringing in a lot of the finance markets. Well, the data centers follow finance. Yeah, no. And I mean, it, it's a boom for Texas because if AI is really going to be the next thing, bringing all of these jobs here, bringing all of these data centers here is good. We do have the some of access to some of the lowest cost energy. When you talk about stranded natural gas, you talk about all this stuff. The real question is, will ERCOT, as you mentioned, be able to handle this R? Because I'm not convinced we want to put ERCOT in charge of making sure our data centers are up and, you know, but that's a story for another. Definitely don't want center point energy in charge of them. Oh, <laughs> I no. would want that there's a couple things about this and that is governor abbott says that he may he's going to have a 10 billion dollar energy fund to double the 10 billion energy fund he's going to have to do think about that the the advantage that texas has is we have natural gas and we can spin up a natural gas plant a lot faster than just about anywhere else in the country so i have to hand it to texas texas may be able to do this Governor Abbott may be able to do this, but there is a lot riding on this thing. Yeah, there is. All right, what's next? Let's go to Texas. Speaking of Texas, love me some Texas. Texas pipeline congestion could throttle U.S. exports at a critical time. Rut row. Texas crude pipelines are nearing capacity with major pipelines between the Permian and the Porta Corpus Christi. Michael running at 90% full. Holy smokes, Batman. You take a look at that map of pipelines. They, you can't swing a dead cat in Texas without hitting a pipeline. And they're running it. No, but we still can't get our gas to market, which is kind of funny. It is. There's some big, uh, big holes in the, from the Permian to Corpus and, and getting them out there. But Haynesville does not have that, but they're expensive more. It's a whole different market for drilling over there. Yeah. 
Shout out to the the Deal Spotlight episode number eight that I just did with John Farrell. I'll be we'll actually be doing a, a full marketing blast here early next week on it. But you can go check it out on our YouTube right now. We talk a lot about this specifically in the Bakken that deal that Devin did to go scoop yep. up Grayson Mill. A lot of what that did was was get that you know Grayson Mill has an extensive midstream capacity that they they own their own pipeline infrastructure which is great I'm, I'm a big fan of turning a cost center into a revenue source gotta love that but the problem is a lot of it's not connected with where Devin is so the point of all that is why is it helpful to own midstream infrastructure well if you can if if you're not allowed to flare you gotta if you if you're you got to put your gas somewhere so you can produce the oil. It's not like you can just produce the oil and not produce the gas. So a gas takeaway, not to make money on it, because a $2 natural gas, no one's making money on it. Right. It's the ability to get your gas to market. And I think it's what it's going to I think that's the, the key thing here. And I think it's what East Daily Analytics, we love them over there, are, is really saying in this in this uh, in the article. Right. One of the things that I would definitely want to do is take a look at data centers in East and West Texas. I'd put a data center in Midland near the Permian where you got all the offtake you could ever want sitting out there. I guarantee you because you're going to have microgrids popping up for data centers. That would be a big one. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right. What's next? Hey, let's roll over to Russia and Iran. Start work on a game-changing energy corridor. Michael, this is at the heart of our discussion in a lot of ways, is that the Iranian petroleum minister, I'm going to butcher his name, I, I almost sound like Scooby when I say it. I have no idea how to pronounce it. Russia and Iran will start working on energy corridor is now $40 billion four-pronged deal in agreed in principle between Russian Gazprom and the state-owned national Iranian oil, but it's also with China for complete in the Asia market for Russian natural gas and Iran really helping out in there unbelievably huge well it because there's i mean and now speaking about what's going on with all this geopolitical craziness that's happening in the middle east right now this means more than anything i mean this 40 billion dollar deal with gazprom has core four elements all which are critical to kind of tightening up that relationship it's a 20 year deal which is which is pretty nuts it is. And when I was talking to George McMillan on the the geopolitical expert, it's about the U.S. trying to shut in Russia from pipelines. Well, Putin has outplayed the United States in chess and has got pipelines all through China coming around to North Korea, South Korea and Japan. And then you're starting to look at all the others around here. And then in this area, it's really putting the wealth for Putin where it is. I mean, he's got long-term contracts now. Yeah, no, he he really does. And it's it's getting spicy. Who, you know, Moscow and Tehran are are becoming close friends now. And Tehran's flying the red flag of revenge and holy mm. smokes. Well, let's let's jump over to oil and gas finance, guys, because we got a lot to talk about specifically when it comes to this. But before we do that, guys. As always, the news and analysis that you just heard is brought to you by the world's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy business. Hit the description below for all of the different links to the articles, links to the timestamps so you can jump around back and forth. Timestamps might be a little off because we've got some ads running. Sorry, we're trying to make a little money here. At then you can also check us out on Substack where you can get early access to all of these articles. Obviously, we're recording this at night, as you can see on my screen back there if you're watching on YouTube. And so it releases in the morning. So go check that out. Also, if you're interested in any of our oil and gas investment opportunities, hit the link that we have in the description below. We've got an awesome project that we're working on right now with our friend Ray Trevino over at the Crew Truth. Lots of great stuff going on over there. You can go ahead and hit that link below to get access to the executive summary and book some time time to talk with us specifically about how you get, how you can get involved with oil and gas investing. 
But still, I mean, pretty pretty crazy from from an oil price standpoint. I mean, let's quickly just cover overall markets today. S and P five hundred up one point five percentage points. Nasdaq and big tech up three percentage points, mainly off the back of Jerome Powell and the U.S. Fed deciding to hold off rate cuts this year, but saying that in September it's likely that we will have rate cuts if trends continue we'll go ahead and read a few quotes from here i don't think the labor market is in current state as a likely source of significant inflationary pressure so i would not so i would not like to see material further cooling in the labor markets again the fed decided today to hold its benchmark rate at its target range of five and a quarter to five and a half percentage points it, it most likely as they will probably be a 25 basis points cut where that target range will be now five to five and a quarter. He also said that a potential 50 basis points rate cut is, quote, not something we're thinking about right now. The FMOC, which is the Federal Open Markets Committee, they'll go ahead and meet in September 17th and 18th, as Stu mentioned before the show, right before the election. <laughs> yeah, aptly time. It's a few months before, so there's there's time to know, time time for things to settle. We also will see Jerome Powell speak at the Jackson Hole Economic Summit in late August. So we'll get a little bit more there. That's really, again, what we're seeing with the, with the two top line. We did see the two and 10 year rates drop two point, you know, basically about two percentage points, 10 year yields, 2.1 percentage points, Bitcoin down 1.75 percentage points, crude oil up five. Point one percentage point seventy eight fifty three big day after three basically three days of losses three straight days of down we have you know opened the day below seventy five or basically at seventy five dollars now we're sitting at seventy eight fifty two unfortunately the reason for that it's a three letter word war we'll we'll talk a little bit with Stu let me get through these numbers here then I want to bring you in Stu the talk Brent oil was only up 1.4 percentage points natural gas was down 3.9 percentage points just two dollars and four cents you know I I I want to hear from you about what's going on in the Middle East but first I do want to if we just throw up the EIA numbers here one of the one of the probably the smaller reasons oil prices is up is that we saw a draw of 3.4 million barrels from the crude oil inventory reserves. That's uh, up from about 3.7 and where analysts were expecting what we saw last week. So not terrible. Gasoline stocks shed a little bit and 3.7 million barrels on the stock draw. Distillates build about 1.5 million barrels. We had a stock decline last week. Very, uh, very interesting. But, you know, the, the big news for oil prices, Stu, is, is one, the fact that Hamas political leader, I'm going to I'm gonna butcher his name, who really cares? He was killed in Iran, most likely by Mossad and Israel, and they, which has just sparked a massive amount of, of interest stuff going on this year. Talk us through what's going on geopolitically, because the craziness right now that that's been that that's been the Middle East in the last 48 hours is really what's causing this this price increase. I'm nervous. In fact, it is it is not good when you have our current White House not talking to Israel and Israel went and took out the leader, the Hamas leader in Tehran. Holy smokes. Hey, don't worry. AP was quick to say it was an assassination. Oh, yeah. Well, it doesn't. You know, this it took is them still... six days to get Trump assassination, right? Uh, oh, yeah. But when the Hamas political leader gets assassinated, oh, they're hot on the presses. Oh, yes. And and so Ananias on Twitter, he is an absolute jewel. He's asking the same questions. How will Iran respond? How will the Houthis respond? How will Hezbollah? Turkey is who we need to watch. Turkey is a NATO member, and Turkey is calling for the head of Israel right now. So they are the one to watch. They're the boiling point, not Iran. Iran, it's Turkey that's getting upset. Yeah, pretty pretty crazy. I mean, it, it's you know, wild. Uh, IG analyst Tony Sycamore, this is a quote out of Waters. I think putting it all together certainly raises the chances of escalation in the Middle East. Talk about, you know, of, of course it does. I mean, that's just most one of the most obvious statements in the thing. Uh, worth noting as well that after three straight weeks of declines, long positioning from speculative accounts and crude oil have been reduced. Hence, conditions are ripe for a rebound. You know, pretty, pretty nuts. I want to move over, though, to two earnings reports. One, Test beating earnings estimates on 
pretty crazy Guyana output. We'll kind of top line numbers here. Hess reported Q2 2024 non-GAAP earnings per share at six at two dollars and sixty two cents, which beat Wall Street consensus by about seven cents. While three point two six billion of revenue was good for a forty percent year over year growth, although it did miss their consensus by thirty million. But at four at three point two billion, twenty million is is just a rounding error. Massive profit increases. Q2 net income was seven hundred and fifty-seven million, or two dollars and forty-six cents per share, compared with net income of one hundred and nineteen million for Q2 of twenty twenty-three. So a huge increase. Adjusted net income came in at a hundred at eight hundred and nine million dollars, compared with two hundred and one million last year. Really, the, the reason for this was was production increase. To of about 27.6 percentage points, 494,000 barrels of oil per day. And that's thanks in large part to a 75% year-over-year increase in Guyana. A year ago, they were doing about 110,000 barrels a day, and now it's up to 192. Bach and shale output was about 212,000 BOP per day, which was up about 17%. They did say that they do expect their production to fall in quarter three as they expect multiple downtimes. In Guyana and their Southeast Asia asset looks like they're going to be doing some natural gas tie-ins. I mean, again, with Guyana, it's a long year. You're talking about a 10-year development plan. So these things are going to happen early on in the life of these development plans specifically so that we can make sure all of the infrastructure is set up as obviously Hess is still locked in this. He said, she said battle with Exxon and Chevron after agreeing to be acquired by Chevron, but Exxon coming in and saying, nope, we have a refusal on this. Again, go check out the deal spotlight I did with Bennett Williams. Great episode where we dive in to all of that. BP, also great earnings, Stu. But what's funny is there's some interesting little nuggets in here. So let's read some of the top line numbers here. BP reported a stronger than expected net profit for the second quarter, which actually beat analyst projections. Fern's prop, the profits were about 2.8 billion, which beat analyst expectations of 2.6 billion. They announced about a 10% increase in the dividend, hiked their share buyback program. What's also funny though is their low carbon and gas division. If you read down closely, actually performed pretty horrible losing pretty horrible. 100 million a quarter <laughs> so profits up but low carbon divisions lose i mean are we shocked are we shocked the more we go renewable the more fossil fuels we will use absolutely you know it's pretty pretty crazy you know uh, this is kind of the first you know second earnings report for murray action close who's the firm's new ceo that took over basically the beginning of the year his quote was our business continues to operate safely and efficiently who cares i mean that's i mean yes you want to operate efficiently and and safely don't get me wrong but i love that that if that's the first thing you got to say it was a, maybe it was an underwhelming quarter for you you know they also went ahead and and gave in a final investment decision on their kadisha development in the gulf of Mexico, which is which is pretty great. That's a, a a big project, which should add huge amount of oil and gas to their underlying guidance. But you know, BP it continues to be a, a shift back to oil and, and away from low carbon. Yep. Last one here, Stu. Why City thinks Trump is bearish for oil? Super interesting here. Hmm. You know, with with you know, we're about a hundred days away from the presidential election and we end with, you know, Kamala Harris recently replacing Joe Biden as the presumptive democratic nominee. The, the, the real thing that I think is on everybody's mind is, okay, how is the oil and gas industry going to fare under each of these candidates? I think, you know, with, with, with vice president Harris, she's going to have to really either come, she's going to have to come on and, and take a stance on fracking. I know she's in the past said she would ban it. She's flip flopped a little bit, you know. I mean, only banning fracking is only going to increase oil prices. I mean, it's that's that's what's hilarious. They think they think banning fracking is all of a sudden going to send oil to zero. It's going to do the exact opposite because now no one's going to be able to drill because you you basically have just turn off the permit if you do that. That'll never pass. You will never pass a fracking ban. So I mean, let's just throw that out there. They can they can. Sp- Say that all they want. They can virtue signal all they want, but they'll never get that passed. But what Citibank is saying is is their new report that really the that really if 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 VP Harris gets elected, all's gonna be well and good for the oil and gas business. But another Trump presidency, quote, could be bearish due to three things: trade tariffs, oil and gas friendly policies and deregulation, and pushing OPEC to release oil into the market. Okay, so Stu, those are the three things they think 
are why oil is bearish. I want your thoughts on because I've got an issue with one of them specifically. Uh, one I got with is him saying push OPEC plus to release oil into the market is effing bullshit. And effing is as swear worthy as I'm going to get on this. And I want to drop an F bomb so bad because the that family friendly is, podcast, a family friendly podcast. And I'm worked up, baby, because this is ridiculous. OK, but this is absolutely ludicrous, Michael. They can Trump would turn our great oil and gas EMP operators loose and it would absolutely drive prices down. I mean, and he well, that's does what they're saying. I, what I, I agree with the overall analysis. I think that Paris wins. The oil industry will it'll be busy. I, I want to back usual. this up for one thing. I don't think Harris is going to be on the ticket. I think they're wow. going to change out the ticket. Now, we, does that, that does not mean anything else. It will still be the Green New Deal and the policies. She is not writing the policies. They're writing the policies. It'll be someone else. Okay. So that being said, the people writing the policies are going to go after and ban fracking on federal lands. Where does that impact? That impacts the Gulf. Well, prices will just go up. I mean, here's the thing. Any Democratic nominee that wins, try, the, it'll be business as usual for the over the look at what's happened the last four years. It's going to stay the same. It doesn't matter who it is. Bob Iger, Kamala Harris, Chuck Schuy, it don't matter who ends up winning. And they um, want three your cousin, trilli three trillion dollars a year yeah. to go to climate well, transition. I saw on Twitter today. Did you hear what they said? They said. It's not really about climate change. It's about reorienting, reorienting the U.S. economy. I mean, they came out and said it today that it's not about it's it's about climate change, but it's really about shifting the economy. So, but okay, I agree with the overall analysis. I think that if Trump wins, you are probably going to see a decline in oil prices. For first, I think two reasons. One, I agree with their first statement due to trade tariffs. Two, I do think he's going to have friendly policies, which is going to continue to increase production. But three, I do not believe that OPEC will do what they did in 2014 and release oil into the market to tank U.S. shale. Because why did they do that? Again, they did that in 2014 to hurt U.S. shale and take back market share. The problem is, though, they hurt themselves in the process. And what exactly. has MBS wanting, want to do? He wants to shift the economy away from oil and gas and into a more balanced economic problem. Because remember, they spend a lot of government money. You want to think a lot they, of government money gets spent, and that all comes from oil. They need, what is it, $100 oil to balance their budget because they're investing so much in an attempt to get them. They're happy. Off. It's a catch-22. In order to yep. get off oil, you got to drive prices up. So that I don't think they're going to release and just completely do a 180. I think they're going to say, cool, the U.S. is going to produce more. Maybe we can even hold back more because, yeah. again, they want higher oil prices. Again, I do think prices will go down. Obviously, we heard, you know, at, at the RNC convention, drill, baby, drill. We love it. Again, it's going to be good for workers. It's, it's, it's good for the overall economy when energy prices are low. So I'm not saying right. that it's a bad thing. I mean, it's $3.50 right now for gas Love a buck eighty. I'm not saying I wouldn't want to go fill up my truck for a buck eighty, but if you're an if you're an upstream oil and gas, prepare yourself. I'm actually in the process of writing exactly. a white paper on this right now about nice. how to prepare yourself as an oil and gas upstream company specifically to handle this type of stuff. Now, obviously, there's other factors that go in, but the volatility that's going to come to the oil and gas business, especially if President former President Trump does win, which I think I, I think I think he will. If I'm a gambling man, I I put my money on that. So assuming he survives until then, you know, <laughs> that's a whole nother conversation. But I, I, I just think it's going to be prepare yourself. I, I mean, now there's the other side of the equation where, you know, we're seeing a lot more NGLs. So all this oil that we're announcing is oil. It's got a lot of LNGs in it. So, yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. I think MDS in Saudi Arabia has a lot more to worry about than trying to pick a price war with the U.S. shale. He's got Russia trying to pump out. The Russia has actually had a lower, the lowest amount that they have produced in the last 11 months this month is the lowest that they've, they've produced. This is pretty significant. 
but you have the other quotas, the other OPEC plus members are overproducing to in order to make their budget numbers. Yep. You have China buying all that they can from the dark fleet because they're going to go to war. If there is a war going on in the Middle East, they're going to take Taiwan. I guarantee you, watch yeah. out. And they, nope. they're raising the roof on their largest LNG storage. So their oil storage and their LNG storage is being built up. What happens when countries build up supply? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So I think it's going to be crazy, but it's going to be crazy. So we'll make this happen. So what else? Uh, it's It's been a great week. Last show of the week. So we'll, it'll be good. Oh, yeah, it, it is. And I want everybody to stay safe out there and have a plan. No, absolutely. So, well, all right, guys, with that, we'll let you get out of here. Have a great weekend. What are they going to hear uh, Friday on the podcast? I've got a podcast coming out with uh, Ronald Stein, a great friend of the podcast. He's, he's a, just a cool cat. Good old Ronald Stein. All right, and then you'll hear the weekly recap on Saturday. We'll take Sunday off and be back in your ear on Monday, guys. We hope you have a great weekend. Enjoy the podcast on Friday. Enjoy our weekly recap on Sunday, and we will see you on Monday, folks. Thank <laughs> you.